it's a huge honor for all of us to welcome you, and you're now part of a prestigious fellowship, the Kennedy Fellowship, which is the premier uh, visiting speaker program organized by the government of New Zealand, Fulbright New Zealand, and the U.S. Embassy. And I wondered what your thoughts were on joining this prestigious program and what your activities and programs will be while you're here in New Zealand. I was tremendously honored when this invitation first came. Um, obviously, the, the Fulbright program is one that is known worldwide in its many manifestations, but when I saw specifically the kinds of people who have um, come to New Zealand under the auspices of this fellowship, it's, it's just a tremendous privilege and honor to be in that company. Um, and it also, you know, I think I'm particularly fortunate in the timing of this is such an interesting moment to get to leave the environment I operate in and come to a place that is both uh, so different and yet so familiar. I'm sort of amazed, having been here only a few days, at how comfortable and easy and yet fascinating and intriguing and surprising it is all at once. I don't quite know how that happens, but it has been a particular pleasure to be in conversation with people that is um, really interesting and, and eye-opening. And so I'm, I feel tremendously blessed to have had the chance to, to make this trip. Thank you. I understand this is your first time to New Zealand, so I wonder what your initial impressions are and what your thoughts are on New Zealand's role in international affairs. You know, there are very few places in the world, I think, that you visit with a certain set of expectations and then those expectations are exceeded. Um, and, and this certainly is, is one of them. Uh, you know, the only one I can think of offhand uh, this year is the Taj Mahal, where I had an expectation of what that would be like and then um, was amazed at the real thing. I had such an expectation about uh, the beauty of this country, the majesty of it, and yet between flying in and driving around and walking around and boating around and all the different ways in which from mountaintop and from uh, ground level, uh, of just being in awe of of what a magnificent and and different feeling place. I feel like there is no place else on earth like this. And so I think you know, obviously, partly because of of culture and film, uh, people around the world have an idea of what New Zealand looks and feels like. It is it is still uh, a, a revelation to come and get to experience it directly. And New Zealand is played an important role in world affairs, uh, ever more so important now that they have taken the presidency of the United Nations Security Council. And you've had the opportunity already in your short time here to meet with some senior government officials. Do you have any thoughts on New Zealand's role in world affairs? Uh, among the, the really interesting conversations I've had with um, with some of both American and uh, New Zealand officials has been about the nature of power and the nature of influence and how those are shifting and in some ways reversing and, and how um, one official suggested that, that because New Zealand doesn't have a lot of power in the traditional sense of an immense military or an immense economy, that it, it exerts power by exerting influence. And, and that I think is a particular opportunity in, in this moment of, of global diplomacy where the power of ideas is, is growing so fast. The ability of a good idea to be tested in one place, shared rapidly and adopted globally. And so the role that New Zealand has traditionally played for whether for governments or for private businesses as a sort of laboratory for ideas is particularly valuable now. I was struck um, when the, the transportation minister encountered David Pluff of Uber at a conference talking about how some of these new industries and new businesses like Uber are going to be regulated around the world, that New Zealand would be a model that other countries would be watching. And I suspect that there are a lot of, of instances like that where, because of the nature of this economy and this marketplace, where an idea can be tested, a product can be tested, a solution to a problem can be tested and refined before being exported. I think that has the potential to really significantly amplify the role that New Zealand can be playing in the world, disproportionate to its actual size and population um, and, and other factors that more traditionally might have influenced its, its power. You probably, more than anyone in the world, have a finger on the pulse on the global current events and trends that are influencing the direction uh, that we're all heading. 
What do you think the world will look like for young readers of Time Magazine? Well, it's so interesting to watch the world simultaneously getting so much bigger and so much smaller in the sense that, that I'm now competing for readers, not just with other American media sources, but with newspapers and television networks and websites all around the world. And so, uh, and that has, made, that has made the world very small in the sense that you can, uh, you can travel anywhere intellectually, you can go exploring any idea, any place so much more easily from you know, the privacy of your home wherever you are in the world. And yet, of course, at the same time, it's made the world so much bigger um, because you can go to the far ends of it and places that you never would have been able to explore. And so I think that that's a challenge to all of us in media is to think so differently, to think so beyond geography, beyond immediate culture, beyond the, the local mindset wherever we are headquartered to say, you know, we have an opportunity to reach a global audience. And I'm even struck with young people that I meet, young people that I interview for jobs who come work for us, that they are more globally minded, I think by far than previous generations. They're much more likely to have traveled themselves. Many have studied overseas in the course of their higher education. And they bring back a, a kind of ecumenical view of, of the media that they consume. They love television shows that are from overseas. They love movies that, have, that are created all around the world. And increasingly, they're, they're consuming content from all different sources. And I think that's only going to continue and expand. And it's a challenge you know, to all of us to, to compete uh, against all new sources around the world and for an audience that reaches all, all around the world. Time has always been a global uh, institution. We have always had, had journalists stationed all over the world. But we have to be working together and in touch with each other in a way much more now because our audiences are all so much more overlapping. What advice would you have to the next generation of women leaders, whether that be in the media or the public or private sectors? I, th I think women leaders share with male leaders an imperative that we haven't really been very successful addressing. And now this is a huge generalization because you know different countries have gone f different distances in addressing the issue of how do we make it possible for people to live balanced lives. And, and I think it's a stereotype to suggest that women are more invested in that goal. Uh, but my instinct is that one of the things that um, makes women look at leadership in a certain way is, will I be able to, to play this role, whether it's in public life, whether it's in the private sector, in media, in the arts, in whatever realm, uh, am I going to be able to play a leadership role and yet also have protected time for other priorities, um, whether it's, it's family or it's uh, physical well-being, spiritual well-being, service to the community, other things that are, that are important as well. And uh, I think it is, it is in the interests of the common good for both men and women to not have to make a, cho a choice between being a leader and living a balanced life, between being a leader and being a servant to their community, a, uh, a significant part of their family, uh, maintain their physical health, maintain their, their mental well-being. The, it is not in anyone's interest for, for leaders in whatever field to have to, to choose. And so I would like to see as, as a wider variety of people, not just um, men versus women, but people from different backgrounds, from different worldviews, coming into leadership roles, that it, it makes us think more creatively about what are the circumstances that bring out the best in leaders and therefore maximize the chances that whatever institution they're leaving is going, is going to thrive. Excellent. Thank you very much.